Thank you, Ben. Um, and thanks for having me. So this morning, I'd like to talk about Python. And I'd like to talk about why Python is for the curious. But first, uh, I actually wasn't intending to, I didn't originally have this slide in here, uh, but I wanted to fit in with uh, the, the crowd here. So I'm going to go ahead and do something that I, I totally despise, <laughs> at least for myself. Um, my name is John Reel. Um, my, the, the things I like to do uh, involve building tools for, for tool makers. Uh, so that involves metaprogramming, compiling, parsing, um, things of that nature. And I've been using Python since uh, Python 1.3. Uh, I, I was introduced to it in the summer of 96 uh, as an intern at NASA. Since then, I went on to use Python at Lucent and uh, more, most recently at the, uh, for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and then somewhere in between there, I went ahead and uh, studying under David Beasley at the University of Chicago, uh, earning a PhD in computer science. And uh, this, this, what we're actually seeing here is an is a unfinished, abandoned building. Um, this is actually a, a shout out to my good friend, Dr. Andy Terrell. Um, this is something I like to do. Uh, it has, it has, I think it actually comes from a, uh, a time in the, in, the, in the late 90s when it seemed like all you had to do was, was start a project on SourceForge and then dozens of developers would just flock to you instantly and build out the rest of your grand vision. So um, this is perhaps my, my claim to shame right here. This is something I've, I've done many times, and, uh, but hopefully um, I hope to make, uh, make good on, on some of the, pro uh, some of the uh, promises of the past. Now, about this talk, uh, I've never given a keynote. Um, most of the time, I'm up talking about something very, spe very specific, very technical, that I'm excited about and I want to share with a, with a larger community. But I, I reflect on what, what kind of keynotes really have an impact on me. And there are keynotes where you do the work, not the speaker. So this is a bit of an experiment. Um, I've noticed that, that, that uh, a lot of talks have kind of run short, and how I normally try to hedge against that is I try to pace myself at about two minutes a slide, but my slide deck isn't, isn't a technical slide deck, so this is actually the first time I, I've kind of given a non-technical slide deck uh, talk. We'll see if I can uh, babble for more than two minutes a slide. So let's, let's start with a question. Are you curious? Uh, I, I <laughs> great hand, hand up already. Um, now I want I actually chose this title to be a little bit provocative because you know curious can have some mixed kind of reactions. Are are are, are you strange? Are you odd? Um, I know my my uh, uh, former advisor Dave Beasley really enjoys uh, kind of playing to this this idea of, of being strange or odd. But uh, that's not actually really the curiosity I'm, I'm interested in talking to you about today. Uh, although I would note that we're all here on a perfectly beautiful weekend uh, talking about programming languages. So you're, I, I think we all are a little bit odd. <laughs> OK, so in continuing with the, this, this kind of edginess, um, could you be pi curious? Um, I think it speak, that, that speaks for itself. But, but again, this slide is really more about the kind, of, the, the kind of curiosity I'm talking about. I'm talking about the curiosity that, that George has. Um, and then when I, but, but of course, where I actually get this image from is actually an Altoids ad. So let's, let's set the Wayback Machine to 1995 when Altoids began this, this uh, ad campaign where they had these, these green posters up and showing various pe things, people. Uh, the one that had the greatest impact on me showed a magician levitating a tin of Altoids in midair, but I couldn't actually find that on the internets, um, bad internets. Um, so I had to settle for George, which is perfectly all right with me because uh, George 
kind of reflects what I think this is really about. And that's beginner's mind. It, beginner's mind, if, you, if you'll take a moment with me, for, with me, is about having, the, having, having a mind that is not burdened by the past or worrying about the future. It just is. So to, uh, to quote uh, Flint Sparks, who uh, I, I saw speak recently, uh, what he talk, when he talks about Zen, he says that really what he's all, all he's really asking is how simple can you make it? So how, how simple can you make it? Okay, so now that we're all simple, and we, we, we kind of arrive though at this thing, where we, we have no, we were, we we're in this stateless moment of grace, but, but we're still receiving all this information. And I, I think that one of, the, one of the things that the brain does is it's, it's just, it wants to know what's going on. That's why we have this, this incredibly complex piece of machinery that actually incurs quite a bit of cost uh, biologically to, uh, to have and maintain. So, we're simple, we're curious. This is the part where I really want y'all to do the most work. What is it you are curious about? Are you curious about the cosmos? Are you curious about people? Maybe your customers. I, I know a lot of people are, are very curious about their customers. Are you curious about the, the brain? Are you curious about the bio, biome? What is it you're curious about? How simple can you make it? Okay, great. So we have this, we're, we actually are going to have to break the rules a little bit. We're gonna have to, gonna have to go back and say, okay, well, there are, we, we do have these patterns. We have these ways of dealing with finding out about things, and, and it largely involves a curious loop. So we try to abandon our prejudices from either our past experience or our future expectations and observe the world around us. And then just using those observations, we try to theorize or come up with some idea of what's, what's, what may be going on underneath the covers. Based on those theories, we can then create predictions. And then we can test those predictions and experiments, which generate more observations. And then we keep iterating in this loop. So how we find out about things involves going through this loop, and how we find out about things in, on mass means trying to tighten this loop and make it as, as fast as possible. Great. So that's where people like me come in. Uh, I, like, I like automating things, and we, we can have, have machines do this for us. So what we're looking at here is a microarray where you're doing 96 separate experiments all in one slide and then you're, and it's all done by, machi by machines. Machines pick the reagents, they drop them in the, in the uh, reaction tubules, and then they evaluate whether something interesting happened or not based on your criteria for, in, for what is interesting. Okay, wonderful, but now how do we tell them what to do? Well, we use programming languages, but what do we want in a programming language? We're talking about doing science here. We're talking about discovering things that we're uh, discovering more about what uh, things we're interested in. I'm lucky. I, I'm interested in computers, so I, I get to find out more about computers um, and get to use all sorts of crazy programming languages to learn more about how I program. But Really, at the end of the day, what you want in science is you want something that's going to get out of the way and just let you do the experiment and do it fast and do it in parallel. So we need something that's easy to learn, 
it's easy to read and write. And, and I think that in part gets into this idea of having something that fits in your brain without too much effort. Um, and, and furthermore, it should be easy to use. Um, the cost of, of getting into the environment, leveraging the environment, should, should be as minimal as possible. So I'm not willing to, at this point, I'm not willing to presuppose that that language is Python. But I, I do think I can present a little bit of evidence, uh, perhaps puzzling evidence, that uh, Python it does approximate something like, like what we really want for doing science. So I was really excited when I was asked to, to give this talk. Um, at the time, I had just received a, a brand spanking new uh, issue of communications of the ACM. And I saw that Python, that I saw this Python for beginners, and I thought that was, that was great. I, I, I've been using Python for almost 20 years, so if you do the math, actually, I'm at, we're, we're, at, we're at about 19 years right now, but I'm rounding. Um, but I, I found it interesting when I actually, when you actually read this article, that they're still kind of echoing this, this uh, an argument I've heard from, for many, many years about how Python is, is, a, is, is a very good teaching language. And what they're really attacking is Java, because Java um, has had, had um, replaced, uh, re had become the AP computer science language. And, and so this was the language that people who were taking uh, advanced placement uh, courses were coming into schools already knowing. And, and it was kind of assumed that this was going to be the, teaching, the, the proper teaching language. But uh, so this actually spends a lot of time talking about how Python is, is better than Java for, t for teaching. But uh, another interesting point I'd like to make here is that uh, I, 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 uh, this was something that was called out in, in the actual web article. Um, but I, I actually disagree with this. And I'm not saying that Java's good for writing small programs. I'm actually saying Python's good for, good, for, good for scale. I think Python scales in a way that a lot of other languages that are parsimonious um, it, it scales in a way that, way that, that uh, allows to create large systems. I mean, in fact, that, that summer of 96, I wrote something, along the or, something on the order of 5,000 lines of Python. And I was creating a, a tool for doing, doing unit test automation. That included all sorts of stuff that hadn't, hadn't made it into the Py Python standard library at the time. I was parsing. I was instrumenting. Um, I was reflecting. And we'll get to that later. So is, is Python easy to fit in your head? I, I think it is. And I, I think it remains a very simple language. Um, the term in the, uh, th that has been thrown around the, in the community a lot is it's executable pseudocode. And I, I think that does hold. Uh, and this also comes up in the ACM article. I think that using white space to delimit blocks it, it, it does, does beginners a, a, a service. And with the right editor, as a coder, you don't miss the braces at all. So it's easy to use. So here's, here's the first uh, eye chart I have. I'm not really out to prove anything by this, but I, just the fact that you have to write five lines, well, I mean, braces included. <laughs> you have to write about three, three real lines of code in Java just to say, hello world. Whereas in Python, you just have to say print, hello world. So we, 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 part of what makes this virtue, it makes Python virtuous for doing science is that it, it, it tightens the loop between, between um, hypothesis and experiment. So in, in, in the Java world, we may observe our program's behavior, assuming we already have, well, actually, okay, let's, let's start from, from scratch. We're, we're going to code first. But then we have to compile. And I don't want to actually 
uh, disparage compilation too much. There are, there are roles that static typing and, and co compiled languages uh, fill, and, and uh, a language like Python allows you to actually leverage those things later. And again, we'll talk about that more. But you do have this extra step where you have an extra thing to enter into the computer. You have to say, compile my program. And then you run it, and then you observe it. And then you see, did I get what the results I expected? And then you go back to changing your code. Whereas in Python, it can be as simple as coding, pressing return, and then observing what happens. So we see this in IPython. We see this in Py oh, the Python interpreter. And that's because, in some sense, Python's curious about you. It's running in this, this it's in its own curious loop. This is uh, where we get this term REPL. It expands to read, evaluate, print, loop. So Python's paying attention to us as we're paying attention to our code. So I, I do think Python is easy to use. OK, great. <laughs> I've just sold you, right? No. Um, but we gotta, we gotta keep, we gotta get things moving on here. So let's, let's go bigger and faster. Let's, let's maybe take this idea of a microarray where we're running multiple experiments simultaneously, and then we're looking for interesting results from those experiments, and, and we're, we're collecting that information, and, and, and then um, considering the, the consequences of those experiments. So one of the tools I've been working with a lot uh, recently is, is Spark. Um, Spark, in a nutshell, is, is a driver for parallelizing code across a distributed network, uh, if you're not familiar with it. I, I, I'm gonna, actually, who here uh, has used Spark? Okay. Okay, well, so Spark comes from this, uh, from the, uh, the, this Java world uh, pro predominantly seen as a way of, of making Hadoop more performant, uh, largely by uh, Hadoop was really Hadoop was really good, is really good at taking computationally bound problems, like like scientific simulations, and turning them into I/O bound, uh, pro making them I/O bound problems, and Spark Spark kind of removes the pain of that now, um, and again largely it's because. It's not taking the step of, of being fault tolerant, and it's, doing, it, it's keeping more in memory and not serializing every, every, every uh, it, it's not checkpointing to, to the disk quite so much as, as Hadoop does. So that's how we get a, a driver and a lot of workers to do our work in parallel for us. Now, <laughs> I, uh, Again, apologies to Andy Terrell. Um, he said yesterday that uh, whenever he sees the wor he sees word count, he, he dies a little bit inside. Yesterday, if you missed it, but um, I've seen a, a prox somewhere on the order of three Spark talks, and and data the Databricks people <laughs> seem to really like this slide <laughs> because it shows how. How that, that not only are they, they running faster than Hadoop, but they're running simpler than Hadoop. The code to actually get the, to, 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 run, in, to run everything in parallel is much more compact. Um, and I, I think that they want, what they really want to do there is, is not focus on the line count so much as what makes their code so much more succinct. And what does that, I think, is a, co is, is a combination of two things. You have one, you have, to, you have no types uh, in, in the sense that you don't have to type in types. You do have types, but we'll get to that in a second. But it, it's hidden away from you if, the compile, if, if Scala or, or, in, or Python can figure out what the types are. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to enter them in. But also, it, it, it includes the right abstractions. And, and what are the right abstractions here? Um, it's largely functional programming. So they have this idea of, of uh, a map 
phase where we get this is where we actually get the term MapReduce, or, or which is the MR and Java MR. They have this map phase where they apply the same function over a large array of data, and then they have a reduce phase where again they're looking for interesting things and they're reporting back to you what the results uh, of running all those all those computations in parallel were. And, and these are these are fundamental concepts to functional programming, and they're included in Python, and they're included in Scala. But let's talk about this a little bit. I, I think that Scala is, it, it's, I, 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 I'm going to have to say that tentatively I like Scala. I think it has some problems that are, are, are related to its being run on top of the Java virtual machine. Um, there's some things that they want to do in terms of uh, pattern matching, which is something that Python actually doesn't do, and, and it's something that I, I, I would like to see more of. But um, another big difference, though, is that, that Scala is actually strongly tied. There, there is a, e even in its read, evaluate, print loop, it's, it, it's, it's running a little compiler, as is Python, actually. Python compiles to the Python virtual machine. Scala is compiling to the Java virtual machine. That's evaluating these virtual machines. Um, now, I wanted to give an example of, of how Python's typing differs from Scala, and I thought this would be a great example. <laughs> but uh, lo and behold, I, Python do, doesn't do this, what I thought a, a scripty language should do, and Scala actually does. So what I wanted to show here was that in Python, types are fundamentally just behaviors. And these are behaviors that can be evaluated at runtime. And so when I, I type 4 plus not the string 99 at the interpreter, it's going, to say, it's going to immediately say, oh, I can't do that. But if I hide it behind a function, it won't, Python won't tell me about that until I call that function. Whereas on the other hand, uh, Scala will because it's, again, doing this, this kind of type inference under the covers. But the thing that, that <laughs> when I ran this experiment, I, I was interested to find that, that foo on, on the, on the right-hand side, that's Scala, t actually typed. And, and not only did it type, but it did the kind of, it did, it did the, uh, the scripty, what I call the scripty thing, in that it used plus to figure out, to, to say, oh, well, um, I, one of those things is a string, one of those things is an integer, I'm going to say John wanted a string. <laughs> and so I was expecting it to, to, to show the definition of the function, and Python is quiet about it, and Scala complains about it, but that's not actually what happened. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> now, I'm actually not sure I explained this, this entirely too well, but uh, if you have questions about how behavioral typing differs from, from, a, a, from a type inference, uh, I, I'm more than happy to talk about that ad nauseum. Now I wanted to, to pause a second here and, and make a point, because we're gonna shift gears a little bit here. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take off my, my pseudoscientist hat, and I'm gonna put on my, my compiler uh, engineering hat. And I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a point um, that hopefully ties what I do into the data world. I, I, I haven't been doing data science, but I have been navigating data for many, many years. And that's because code is data. Data may not necessarily be code, but code is data. And so how do we look at that data? Python, Python and Java, and, and therefore Scala, give you these, the, this, this ability to do reflection and introspection. And what reflection is, is basically we are reflecting at the, at the language level what's going on inside the virtual machine. You have a way of, of, of querying your virtual machine and say, what's up? Um, and introspection gets into is just 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 short of metaprogramming in the sense that what you're what you're having is a program reason about itself using reflection. So reflection alone 
just tells me what's going on. And introspection is when my program uses reflection to figure out what's going on and adapt appropriately. So I had this image here of a reflection, but um, I wanted to give you pointers into where, 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 where to get started if you're interested in doing this in Python. So things like, like DIR, which is just a way of, of inspecting namespaces. The under, under dict. Everything in Python is an object, and, and more often than not, the properties of those objects are up here in these dictionaries that you can, you can read and navigate through. The compiler itself is actually reflected out to the surface language, as is the parser. And finally, if you're really interested in seeing what's going on under the covers, you can use dis, which is a disassembler. And it takes, you can, you can just hand it a Python function, and it tells you what byte codes are actually being used at the virtual machine level to run that, to run that function or that program. And so this, this begins to get into a space of data exploration. Um, I really wish I had more time. I, I think we all do. Um, and what I mean by that is a time, time to explore how to represent information in a succinct and useful way. So what I'm, I'm showing here is, is really what I kind of think of, of as a culmination of, of reflection and introspection. This is an object browser. I'm, I'm sorry for the eye chart. I was looking for a better example, but um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find it. So I, I just went with, with the simple thing that, that, that popped up. But what we're looking at here is we're looking at an object browser in Python that represents objects in a namespace as a tree that you can navigate through. And it, this, this is, it's done lazily, so, so you can navigate through this information um, without uh, worrying about it loading all your, your program state in at once. I wanted to maybe demonstrate some of this stuff. So let's do a little demo here. I wanted to look at, look at my, my stuff. I'm going to start up the Python interpreter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I'm talking about here. OK, great. So that's DIR. That tells me what the top level namespace, what's going on there. So let's, we don't have much going on in there. Most of the funds and built-ins, if you're, if you're curious. But let's, let's import a module. Let's import the parser. I like the parser. I, I like writing parsers. Uh, this one happens to be rather fast. But now we can ask, what's going on there? Oh, well, we have, we have stuff. We have uh, this AST type, which is an abstract syntax tree. It's uh, a high-level representation, but still machine-readable. Um, version of your code. Uh, we have a, probably an exception there, uh, a type that probably that actually aliases the ASD type. And then we have a few we have a few functions down below that, that mutate that, that get us into this space of uh, taking code and getting abstract syntax out. So let's go ahead and look at that. an IPython. Okay. Again, I apologize for two things, actually. Uh, the fir first the thing I wanted to show is I actually wanted to show how easy it what is to get started writing one of these things. And I, I think that speaks to the power of Python's uh, reflection and introspection. I think the, the, the hoops that you have to jump through in Java are, are not only confusing because they're munged with this, this marketing concept of Java beans, but um, that, that those libraries aren't as, as, as predominantly, aren't as much in the forefront and aren't, aren't as loved as they are in Python. So let's look at the, par we've looked at the par parser module from the command line. Let's do it graphically. So again, if I, was, if I was writing this, I would actually make this 
a lot larger so I could show you everything. And, and uh, um, I seem to recall at some point there being a, a, a if you're not familiar with uh, Tekinter, that's a, a, a GUI package, uh, one of the first ones that's uh, shipped with Python since I got started with it. And um, I seem to recall there being a demo of using the grid layout to create something not unlike this, where, but, but instead of having a tree interface, what it did is it actually popped up a window for each of your objects, and then you could click on a button, and it would open up another window that looked at that object. And then with a few short modifications, one, probably one of the first things I did as soon as I, I started, I, I, I got into this, and my, my eyes were opened to this whole world of, of introspection and, and data that I can look at and navigate and browse. Um, it was easy to modify it so that I only opened up one window per object. Rather than creating a window every time you clicked a button, it would say, do I already have a window up for this button, for, for this object? And it would bring it to the, to the foreground. But this is a little bit more sophisticated. It, it uses a, a more sophisticated uh, wi widget tool set. Uh, specifically, this is uh, using a Qt via PySide. And again, we can just go through this stuff ad nauseum. See if we can get to the code. No, I'm not going to do that. OK, fair enough. But that's object browsing. That's, that's a way of navigating data. It's well structured. It's not, it's not semi structured or unstructured. So my job's a little easier. Although I do work with, with, with parsers, so you do have concrete syntax. And that, that, that is creating structure from, a, from unstructured input. So great. We have this ability to introspect. We have this way of reasoning about what, what there is. We have this way of running, uh, of creating more very easily. And we have a, have a way of, of iterating quickly on our experiments. But one of the great things about, about being a compiler uh, geek is, is that fractions of seconds still, can, still ha can have a big impact on how long it takes a piece of code to run when you're running millions of computations in parallel. And so that's, that's why I've spent a lot of time uh, re more recently working on the number project. But um, there's, there's a whole ecosystem of tools out there that once you have your code, once you have your initial experiment set up, you can say, oh, well, I want to take this, and I want to go large with it, and I want to go fast with it. So you can get your results faster. So here I just, I just shout out a few things that came, off, came up to the top of my head. This is no way meant to be comprehensive. But uh, NumPy gets you a good boost when you're doing numerical computations on vectors or uh, multidimensional arrays. I think um, PyPy is, is, is interesting, and it's going to continue to be interesting, uh, particularly since uh, it was announced most recently at PyCon that they, they have a story now for including uh, extension modules, which was really one of, the re one of the things that was keeping PyPy out of this, this numerical land. Uh, and actually, it was that, that, it was that uh, gulf that I think led to the development of the number project. Um, Cython is, is a great tool. Um, it's a way of taking your existing Python code and then creating C code from it and then compiling that with a little bit Excuse me. With a little bit more markup of your code, you can actually start optionally typing bits of it and, and seeing in not, not just speed up, but in very impressive speed up. Because perhaps I should have mentioned this at the beginning, why Python gets you that, that tight loop of, of the read eval print is it's, it's, is it's hitting a virtual machine. It's not actually creating a, a um, machine code. And so it, it, embedded in that loop is, is yet another loop of, of interpretation. And that, that, the rule of thumb with interpretation is that's going to give you an order of magnitude slowdown. So what we want to do is we want to take these high-level languages and we want to make them go as fast as the lower-level languages. And 
Cython is, is a good way of, of getting into that space without actually having to write C. But if you're interested in writing C or C++, you, we also have tools for integrating that, those code bases into Python. So we have CFFI, we have SWIG. Um, and I, I think that these were more important in an earlier age when we were still dealing with this idea of legacy code. Um, there was a lot less Python out there in the, in the wild in the beginning, and, and we had people who had already invested in large C, C++, and Fortran code bases. But at the same time, we wanted to bring in, take those code bases, and we wanted to, to, to uh, add these abilities of, of reflection and introspection so that we could, we could rapidly mock up things. And again, there's number. So where are we with that? Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Jake Vanderplas. He, uh, he wrote a blog post, and I, I, I'm using his, this graph from that post. And he's talking about, you know, if, if I want to do a pairwise distance between two, two, uh, two vectors, uh, how long does that take? Um, so you have a Python loop, which runs in what appears to be a little over 10 seconds. And then you have NumPy, which is once you use NumPy, you can get that down to somewhere around a tenth of a second. But then we start going into some other stuff where, where you have scikit-learn, where they've gone and done some optimized, wrote some optimized code, and that goes faster. And we have f to pi, where we're writing it in Fortran, and then we're integrating it through, through uh, scipy. We have scipy itself. Uh, actually, I, I didn't read in, read in depth enough about what that's talking about. But then we have these two, the, the, at the, over at the tail, we have a hundredths of a second with Cython and Numba. And I don't want to, I don't want to misrepresent this. I, I think Cython has a more complete coverage of the Python language than Numba does. But there are these, still these cases where you can quickly just take a, tech, take a decorator, add it to your code, and make it go faster. And I think that's a great story. Uh, uh, so... <laughs> I think that's about as technical as I want to get. I, I, I ho hopefully, you, you, I've, I've whetted your curiosity about Numba. Um, but I did want to, I wanted to take a moment to, to, to speak to some stuff that I, I heard uh, Peter Wang and, and Andy Terrell talk about yesterday. And so I was, I was thinking about this. Oh, it's a, we have the, this glue language that allows us to glue together other, other code bases at the CABI level. Um, and then, uh, but at the same time, we like to eat this but we, we like to eat our own dog food. I, I like to eat my own dog food as a, as, a, as a tool writer. And so perhaps Python is tasty, tasty glue. I'll leave it to you again as an exercise as to what the full implications of that. But also, uh, again, with the tale of Numba, what we're really looking for is cost-free abstraction. So we want to we take a half-baked sketch of an idea, and we want to push push Peter's solve button, and we want, a, we want an optimal data processing system. I'll, I'll come out the back end. We're not there yet, but we have ways of, of, of approaching there. We have ways of, of, of translating your Python code into C. We have ways of translating your code into assembly language. And, and we're, we're constantly working on, on, on making, it, making the barrier of doing something like this lower without solving all the world's problems all at once. I wanted to quickly mention that one of the, another thing you get with Python is, is, is batteries. But where those batteries come from, and okay, so batteries are included. That was, that was an old sales pitch for Python. Um, and what that means is that Python has a lot of stuff in it already in the standard library. If you, wanted a, if you want to write a, a HTTP server, it's, it's a one-liner. Um, in fact, you can do it from the command line at this point. Um, but where those batteries came from is a large community that, that's there to, that, that, that's very friendly and likes to share their code. And so I wanted to talk about these, these organizations enable Python to have these batteries, to, to have batteries. But also they, they, they give you a 
personalized way uh, of, of coding, that uh, la languages that were written um, in, this, in the 70s, actually we have, they probably have their origins in the 50s, uh, you, it, it's hard to talk to their, their language designers. You can still go to PyCon and walk up to Guido and say hi. So what you, what you, I, I, there, there's still a kind of a personalized feeling to that. And if, you, if, if new people aren't getting that, then talk to me. Talk, talk to the community representatives, because this is what really we want to do. Is we want to reach out. We want to share our love of software, of good software, tasteful software, with the world. So we're about done here. But I want to, I want to go back to, to I, I'm hoping everyone was doing their homework while I was babbling and remind you, what did, what, what, what did you think of? What is it you're curious about? And then I'll tell you what I'm curious about. I'm curious about the second question, and that is what tools do you need to learn about what you're curious about? So that's it. Um, uh, I, I think I might have missed the point where, where oh, no, I did. I, I, I got it. Python, Python the, it, it's the curiously strong language. And, and I mean that in the sense that it was, it, it's amazing what an interpreted language can do when, when done well. So it's curiously strong language for the curiously, for the strongly curious. And uh, I think that slide also keeps the edge of being Pi curious alive. Um, Thanks for listening to me, and, and thank you for sharing, for sharing your, your, putting your thoughts out there into the new sphere, whether, whether you're going to share them with people today or, or in the future, that's up to you, but they're out there, and we, we, can, we, can, we can explore them. Thanks, and I'll be, I'll be happy to take questions.